The topic I'm going to be talking about today is, in fact, on communication. And it is communication between cells, between different cell types, and between different organs. Uh, but we are at such a uh, early stages of uh, this field that uh, you will see that there are uh, many exciting and interesting questions that uh, one can address in, in future. And I highly recommend that if you're interested in this type of research to get in this field now early on because again it is a very uh, early stages of uh, this particular part of communication uh, exosomes, which I'll talk about today. In many respects, uh, I feel that uh, we are at, uh, we're feeling what Alexander Graham Bell felt early on. That is, um, to go through a lot of research and development and be able to transmit just a little bit of information from one point to another. So <clears throat> in many respects, um, um, many of us in the field, we feel this way. And of course, one of the first words that uh, he put out was, Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you. And this was a phone call from New York City to Chicago. And uh, for us, it is almost the same when we want to define how does, for instance, a brain or parts of the brain or molecules within the brain are able to communicate with other body parts, including liver or uh, kidney and so on and so forth. So it is a means of communication that I'm going to tell you about today and, um, and how that connects to viruses, which, uh, uh, which is also very interesting. In many respects, uh, we are doing research. And again, I'm a newcomer myself to this field. About three, four years ago, I got into this because uh, we're doing uh, things that uh, we really don't know much about and we're trying to discover. Um, not only its potential, but also its um, uh, relationship to disease, per se, and whether um, it is important for various stages of disease development or uh, uh, development period, so going through different stages of aging. Um, this field had been around for a long time. In fact, it turns out that it's been, uh, people have published quite a bit for about 25, almost 30 years, and they started with single cell organisms. And at the top, um, you see the Nobel Prize for 2013, uh, Jim Rothman, Randy Shackman, and Tom Sotoff. Um, they were uh, doing this type of research in mid-70s. And it took a long time for people to realize the potential of this, uh, um, these molecules and, and how they're involved in communication. And at the bottom, I'm giving you a description, or at least a, a cartoon of what these exosomes look like. And I think you can see on the right-hand side, there is this so-called, uh, there's a tennis ball. Uh, and if you come toward the middle of this diagram, you will see things like viruses. And right next to it is an antibody. In fact, these vesicles I'm going to talk to you about today are very much uh, similar to viruses, with one big exception. They do not replicate on their own. Uh, so this is really what makes this type of research very difficult. Um, whereas it's a lot easier to do this research um, or similar type of research with viruses, whether they're RNA or DNA viruses, because they do replicate. So it's very easy to amplify them, whereas working with exosomes is quite difficult or these extracellular vesicles. Um, the other thing I want to tell you uh, is about um, a little bit about my own background. I'm really a virologist by training. And um, I do a lot of my research in a nucleus of a cell. So for the past 22 years or so, I've been in the nucleus. And I've had a hard time trying to get out of a nucleus and go into a cytoplasm of a cell. And now all of a sudden, I'm going even outside of a cytoplasm. So to me, this was a really a different galaxy altogether when you think about it. And I want to credit a colleague of mine Monique Van Hook, who initially introduced me to this topic, uh, which I knew nothing about. So we're new at this ourselves. So we went back and looked at the literature. And it turns out the cancer people have been doing this type of research for about 10 to 15 years. And they've made some remarkable discoveries. So we are now trying to understand that literature and see if we can apply it to the infectious disease literature. Um, there are different forms of these extracellular vesicles. So in the left-hand side, you see resting or activated cells. And they are secreting what's called multivesicular bodies. These are 
means of communication between cells and between organs. In fact, it turns out these uh, multivesicular uh, uh, bodies, which I'm going to generically call them exosomes, they are important for many sources of communication, including development. That is, um, one of the biggest places where you can see the effect of the exosomes is in development, especially in the first trimester or early stages of development. So this is part of a normal process of cells going through development and they use these vesicles for communication. On the right side you see the so-called apoptotic bodies. These are the cells that are about to die or in the process of dying and they secrete or they're trying to get rid of things that they no longer need and that's the means of a cell trying to survive. Uh, whether at the end of the day that cell survives or not depends on the conditions but uh, as you can see, the apoptotic bodies, they are larger and they certainly have different uh, composition uh, inside of them. And then at the bottom you see the uh, cells that are either potentially infected or tumor cells. And they also secrete various sizes of vesicles which are a uh, little bit different than the exosome. So they're really uh, three classes of these molecules. There's the small, medium, and large, and I think the small ones are somewhere around 50 to 100 nanometers, and that's really the size of most RNA viruses. And I will give you an example of four RNA viruses today and their significance in relation to exosomes. Uh, what exactly is an exosome and how, does it different, how is this different than other particles? They are well defined, so they're anywhere from 50 to 100 nanometers. Uh, they do have um, um, membrane uh, components, mostly tetraspanins, and uh, various uh, uh, proportions of these tetraspanin molecules, including CD63, CD81, uh, and there is four or five other molecules on the surface. They also utilize an exit pathway, and that's really the main topic. One of the main topics I'm going to talk about today is the escort pathway, and this is where these uh, vesicles need to be released from the cell and they utilize this, uh, this so-called escort pathway which is almost identical to the same uh, uh, exit release of viruses. So for instance viruses whether they're RNA or DNA viruses they use the same pathway to leave that infected cell. Exosome like uh, vesicles, the second one down, they're smaller, they're about 20 to 50 nanometer. Um, they do originate from uh, uh, multivesicular bodies um, and the, the distinct uh, difference is that they lack the so-called escort protein within them. Then there are microvesicles. These are 100 to 1000 nanometers. They originate from the outward budding, um, which is distinctly different than exosomes because they are formed intracellular first and then right at the time of maturation, they're about to leave the cell. Um, they do not contain the tetraspanin proteins and the lipid composition is very similar to plasma membrane. So there are some subtle differences that you can see there. Apoptotic bodies, they are larger. Um, they do contain DNA. This is one of the hallmarks of apoptotic bodies. So that's one way to separate the apoptotic bodies away from the rest of these. Now because this is a um, somewhat of a tedious type of research and not easy to do, uh, unlike the viruses where they replicate and you can really make massive amounts of viruses in vitro, um, the literature that is surviving early on is the literature that is extremely careful with their uh, attention to the details. That is how do you purify these exosomes? Do you use a kit? or do you go through so-called centrifugation steps, which are a lot more difficult. And also looking at various components inside of these exosomes, and will you be using uh, 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 simple methods such as Western blots, or do you go through other methods that are far more sensitive, including ELISA? So you can see early on in this field where uh, there's a so-called the quick set of experiments, the quick and dirty set of experiments which may or may not survive through time and then you have the people who are doing really the careful set of experiments who are going through a lot of purification per se before they do their experiments. Uh, exosomes can be found uh, in just about everywhere in the body. In fact, 
All of us in this room do have the exosomes. The number of exosomes in the bloodstream is somewhere around 10 to 12 to 10 to 13. Those are very high copy numbers, so it is not difficult to isolate these in vivo from in vivo fluids. Uh, they are considered immune privileged. That is, the molecules are uh, uh, protected by a series of enzymes that are outside of these vesicles, and therefore they can have an increased half-life as much as 20 to 30 years. So sometimes the components that are inside these exosomes can survive a long time, certainly longer than the half-life of many cells in our bodies. Um, I've, and then uh, the biogenesis, that is the maturation and the exit of these vesicles is uh, very similar to viruses. And in fact, I'll show you one slide that we found lately that they compete for exiting. That is, if you keep a virus that's actively replicating, now the number of exosomes that are released are lowered. On the other hand, if you slow down the release of that virus, now the number of exosomes that are released increase over time. Uh, I've put up two of the uh, websites that are quite useful. There are a lot of meetings and uh, international and local meetings related to exosomes. Anybody's interested, let me know. In fact, I think in Norfolk, about um, two, three weeks from now, there will be a herpes virus exosome meeting. It's a one day. And then the other end is a, there's a, another meeting in May, Rotterdam. Um, uh, there will be uh, Amsterdam. Uh, uh, Rotherdam, actually, and that's an international meeting on extracellular vesicles. So if anybody's interested, let me know. And in fact, now people are using these exosomes not only to understand what's in them, but also utilize them for delivery purposes. And I'll parallel this delivery to the nanotechnology uh, in a few slides. And I think as you can see at the bottom, things such as uh, anti-inflammatory molecules such as curcumin or anti-cancer, uh, etoposide, and many other drugs can in fact be packaged into these exosomes and used for release. Now, today if you go to a pharmaceutical industry and say what is one of the biggest issues that's important for you or ask the same question from funding agencies including NIH, they will tell you that just about everybody has a drug of interest that will inhibit or activate a pathway. But the number one problem is how do you get that compound in a given, to a given tissue or to the right place? So all of a sudden, the nanotechnology arena has become quite significant in relations to how do you deliver or how do you trap things. And of course, people within that technology are looking very closely to neighboring fields, including exosomes. Now, on the left side, you see an example of a virus. It has uh, well-defined structures. That's an HIV, by the way. And it has outer uh, proteins that are glycosylated outside, well-defined. The crystal structures are known. Inside of it, you have RNA molecules that are important for replication, so on and so forth. On the right-hand side, you see a generic picture of a, an exosome, where on the membrane, you have a series of proteins that are important for its maturation and for signaling, uh, including tetraspanins. And then inside of these exosomes, you have anywhere from 200 to 2,000 different proteins, depending on whose literature you read and whose uh, papers you believe. So the contents within these exosomes are not quite well defined. And that's one of the things that the field is trying to uh, address and each of each lab is essentially try, trying to address somewhat similar set of questions. So the sizes are similar, but the functions are quite different. Their behaviors are quite different, and I would argue that it is a little bit more difficult to study the exosomes simply because they don't replicate as well. Now, if you look at a virus life cycle, you have a um, specific binding of a virus to a cell surface receptor, and then you have an entry, and that's why you have the so-called tropism. Um, and then, of course, once you enter, there are multiple steps. In the case of HIV, there are 18 different steps before that virus is ready to leave that cell. And this very last part of the exit is really what has captured the imaginations of the exosome uh, field. And so they are looking at and using viruses as tools 
looking at the components that are important for the exit of the exosomes, and they can do side-by-side -side set of experiments using viruses. And HIV certainly is a perfect example of this. To get into a little bit of a nitty-gritty detail, there are about 70 to 80 different proteins that are important at the very last stages of exit of these exosomes or viruses, and they are on the left side, SCART0, SCART1, 2, 3, and 4, and all of these proteins have to come together in a concert fashion, and eventually with the help of ATPA, ATPases, so the enzymes that allow the release of these molecules, that particular exosome or the virus is being released. So you can imagine of using or utilizing inhibitors against any of these 50 molecules or so, and that way you can control the release of the so-called exosomes or even viruses. So the, the current uh, research in the field, uh, whether it's a cancer field or infectious disease field, deals with three topics. The left side is the parent cell, so many of us are asking if a cell is infected, for instance, as a result of a HIV infection or Ebola, uh, what are some of the exosomes that it will release? Uh, if it is infected with a cancer-causing uh, virus, including HTLV-1, uh, you know, how do those differ from the uh, apoptotic viruses? So the left side is the uh, set of questions related to the parent. In the middle bottom, you will see the exosomes, and this is really what we're, many people are trying to figure out, including uh, utilizing technologies such as omics, or proteomics, lipidomics, looking at the metabolites, looking at the RNA molecules, so on and so forth. And then on the upper right-hand side, you see the recipient. And it is really, at the end of the day, what does all of this have to do with the recipient cell? If the recipient cell does not take up these exosomes, then maybe they don't really have much of a function. Therefore, the exosomes could be used as biomarkers. So, we do have to watch three items every time we do our research. It is the parent cell, it is what is being released, and it is also uh, the uh, recipient cell. We were very excited um, that quite a few people at NIH, including program officers, have paid close attention to our work. Uh, this uh, last year, uh, 2015, they put out uh, multiple RFAs, and they actually used our work from George Mason to cite uh, the reason why putting up these RFAs. And I'm happy to say that we were able to uh, submit uh, grants to this particular RFA, and we were able to get it. So we're just waiting for the uh, notice of award from NIH. Uh, but it is a topic that many people are interested in these days, and they are uh, paying close attention to it, including the program officers. Now, a uh, few slides on nanotechnology. Um, wh whoever is doing work on exosomes or these type of vesicles, they have to pay close attention to nanotechnology because these two fields are running in parallel. Uh, one of them is biologically um, uh, made type of particles and the other is man-made. So many of the principles that are being utilized today for nanotechnology or nanoparticle delivery or development is using some of the principles that we've learned from exosomes. So for instance, on the left side you see solid lipid nanoparticles. These are very easy to make. You can in fact uh, make them. They are not antigenic. You can use them for delivery purposes or even capture purposes. Um, in the middle you have nanoemulsions. These are liquid lipid cores. So for instance, if you have molecules that are um, hydrophobic, that would be really um, uh, good to utilize for packaging purposes. And the right-hand side, you see the liposomes. Many of us in this room probably have utilized these liposomes in some shape or form. And you can get very creative. You can put uh, uh, hydrophobic drugs in the side or in the middle. You can put um, uh, uh, hydrophilic or even mixture of these compounds. So you can really go creative and try to do um, uh, as much as possible in order to create them and delivery. And I think one perfect example of this is in the HIV field where they're using combination of antiretroviral drugs uh, and people are using these drugs, the three of them, 
ritonavir, uh, lopinavir, and efarovans, and all three of these are inhibiting various stages of the virus replication. And uh, the reason this is exciting is because if you throw in these drugs, the half-life of drugs are very short. Within 6 to 12 hours, they're either degraded or grabbed by, by a tissue. So you no longer see the effect of the drugs. But when you put them in these liposomes or in these molecules and you deliver them to specific areas, for instance, like brain, now all of a sudden you have almost perfect delivery of drugs into tissues that are otherwise impossible to get to. Um, and, and there are other very creative ways of doing this. People are now using um, viral proteins, including the HIV TAT, to just focus these uh, uh, liposomes directly into, um, into specific tissues. Um, along these lines, we work with Series Nanosciences. Series Nanosciences is um, um, a creation of uh, Lance Liotta and Chip Petrocoin, and we've been quite excited working with them and this particular company. Um, they provide uh, us with a lot of these nanoparticles. Now, they are acrylamide-based. They are not um, initially designed for delivery purposes, but they're perfect, almost perfect, for capturing of molecules. And we've utilized these principles not only to capture uh, small molecules, but also larger molecules such as exosomes. And lately, we've been using them for delivery. So if anybody's interested, I highly recommend please look up their website. Um, it's a very mature technology um, uh, with people who are serious about it. And so the data, the quality of the data that comes out from these people is quite uh, reliable. And one example I can give you is on the upper left side is a condition where if you have a mixture of a virus and an exosome, which would be very difficult to separate from small volumes, including, let's say, if you're doing pediatric work, all you get is about 100 or 200 microliters of serum. Or if you're doing CSF work, that's about 100, 200 microliters. So in the upper left side, it shows you a, a series of nanoparticles that by simple salt wash, you're able to separate the virus away from the exosomes. And in the right-hand side, upper right-hand side, that shows you the genuine RNA. And at the bottom, it just shows you the cartoon where you have a mixture of the nanoparticles. Uh, you, have, you have a mixture of exosomes with virus. And then you go through salt washes. And this way, you can, in fact, separate these two entities from one another. Now, the separation is not 100%. There is no such thing in biology, but I will call it enrichment, which is good enough for early stage uh, series of experimentations. Uh, and one thing we found is that exosomes in the bottom left, uh, the charge on the surface is about, uh, is mostly negative charge, whereas some of the viruses that we're using are positively charged. So as a result, it's, it makes life much easier in terms of binding and purification. Um, again, if anybody's interested, let me know. There's a few publications now on this, the concept. Um, and uh, again, it's a mature technology. So what I'd like to do in the next 20 minutes or so is give you examples of four viruses. These are RNA viruses. They enter a cell. Two of them are not only cytoplasmic RNA viruses, but they also do something extra. That is, they make a DNA molecule out of themselves and integrate into the chromosome, hence the reason why it's so difficult to do cure for things like HIV or HTLV1. The other two viruses are uh, vector-borne mosquitoes, and also I'll, uh, this is Rift Valley Fever. Um, I work with some of my colleagues at the other end, and also with Ebola. And I'll show you some of the examples of exosomes from Ebola. This short RNA that I'm showing you in the middle bottom, uh, it says short transcripts. These transcripts have been around for almost 20 years and in the HIV field. And not very many people could figure out what they do. And uh, I think we were able to figure this out at the end of the day. So we published the first paper in 2007. A year later, we had a, another colleague, Pat Probos, who identified almost identical sequence and identical data. Uh, using pyrosequencing, uh, late KT Jang at NIH, uh, he also identified similar sequences from infected cells. Uh, ben Burkout in uh, Netherlands, um, again, independent body, independent virologist doing similar experiments, they found 
uh, similar data, and then a husband and wife team in France, again, very similar data. And then finally, uh, Mark Fisher, and I'll show you his paper next, uh, found not only few, but uh, close to 123 or 125 different RNA molecules. So the idea here was, if a virus replicates, and if you put that infected cell under a drug control, that is, you put antiretroviral drugs on that cell, the virus is slowed down, but the stuff that comes out of that cell resembles the virus or has bets and pieces of the virus. And what I'm going to show you is that those bets and pieces include things like viral RNA that are non-coding. In other words, they don't make protein, but they are non-coding RNA, which we are calling them long non-coding RNAs. And essentially, we're trying to figure out what they do. So this is Mark Fisher's paper. At the so this is the entire genome of the HIV. It's about 9.5 KB. And at the bottom, you see the sequences that have been done. So this is an RNA sequence. And they've done the RNA sequence. And they've looked at how does it compare to the rest of the virus. And I think you can see on the left side, there is a straight line coming down. That's that short RNA I was telling you about. And then all the other RNAs throughout the genome uh, at the bottom portion, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer, so I can't quite point. Uh, let me see if I can, yeah, maybe I can use the arrow here. So all of these are RNAs that, in fact, matched different regions of the virus. So you can easily imagine that a virally infected cell, if it survives and it doesn't die, it is going to be secreting a lot of these uh, RNA molecules. So in 2013, we published the first paper on this. It was a JBC paper. And essentially, we went through a series of purifications. This is an uninfected cell. This is an infected cell. And right off the bat, and this is a silver stain, I think you can tell that the CD63 levels, which is a marker of the uh, exosomes, is slightly higher. But what's even more important is that the amount of proteins that's within these exosomes from infected cells is lower. That turns out to be the case. Every time you see exosomes from infected cells, the amount of protein is certainly lower. On the panel B, you see a bunch of Western blots. And I think you can tell one of the molecules that we've been banking on is the CD63. It's the tetraspanin. And we've been very lucky because it shows that these exosomes contain extra amounts of these CD63. So it makes life easier for us to capture these exosomes and do our uh, research. And in panel C, you see EM, basically. And these exosomes do look smaller. Uh, we went back and we looked at uh, multiple different cell types from HIV-infected cells. Here is uh, two T cells, AD5 and ACH2. And here is a myeloid cell. And here is a HeLa cell. And then we looked at the so-called short transcript. And I think the black bar you can see in every case. Uh, the amount of these short transcripts that's coming out is uh, really quite significant. And you're talking anywhere from 10 to 4, 10 to 5, and in some cases, 10 to 6 copies of RNA coming out of cell. So it is almost resembling what happens with the virus, because in many cases, you can get anywhere from 10 to 5 to 10 to 9 or 10 to 10 virus replication out of a single cell, depending on the virus. And of course, the amount of RNA that's coming out of these infected cells are quite significant. They're in logs. So we published initially about this particular work. And this is a so-called TAR. It's a stem and loop structure. It's a 23 basis stem. And of course, nobody paid attention to this. And this is that short transcript I showed you early on. This is the, um, the dimension of it and, and the way it looks. And very lately, we found a RNA molecules from HIV-infected cell that may be quite structured. And we're calling this a long non-coding RNA, somewhere around 1,500 bases or so. We have no idea what it does. And we're trying to figure out if it has any role. We've looked at multiple different cell types. So here is all of these are infected. Here's a T cell, a T cell, a myeloid cell, monocyte. And here is a glial cell infected with HIV. And in all cases, whether you not treat them or treat them with antiretrovirals, you do see a lot of these RNA molecules coming out. So the scale is from 10 to 7 to 10 to 4. And again, the 
numbers are quite high. And of course, if you look at the uh, genomic RNA, the levels are slightly lower, but again, they are present uh, in these exosomes. The number one question has been for us, if these exosomes are made, will they have infectious properties? That is, if you take them and put them on a recipient cell, will they replicate? And the answer to that question is no. In the case of HIV, every time you take Every time you take these exosomes and put them on a recipient cell, you do not see replication. Now, this is not true with two other fields. Hepatitis C virus field, they find exosomes that are infectious, which is quite interesting. And also, people who do herpes virus HHV6B, that's the cause of roseola in children, that also, that virus causes uh, or creates exosomes that are infectious. But by and large, majority of the exosomes are not infectious. So this is from, again, a scanning of the entire genome. You can see it at the bottom. Uh, this is the entire genome of HIV. And what you can see is if you scan it, the left side, you see a lot of these RNAs. And as you move forward, it uh, gets lower and lower. So we think 60 percent of these RNAs are the short tar molecules. About 30% are these things called we call tar gag. Whether they're coding or not, we don't know. And 10% are genomic. Whatever the case, these vesicles contain parts of a virus, but they are not infectious. That's what I want to try to get across. In collaboration with Mary Young at Georgetown, we worked with her for about 15 years or so. These are four patients, and we are looking at not only their cells, so these are the PBMCs, but also we're looking at their serum. And lo and behold, we do see the TAR and the TAR gag present in three out of four. Uh, panel C is the, uh, the treatment that they're uh, going through. And of course, panel D is the number of DNA molecules you can find in these patients. So the DNA virus or the DNA molecules are low because the number of cells in these patients are, the infected cells are very low. But over time, imagine if you are infected and you're infected for 10 years, your virus may be low, but the amount of exosomes may increase. Um, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. What we do know, and that's what we published about two, three months ago, is the, the stem and loop structures are controlling things in cytoplasm, whether they're controlling the innate immune molecules in the cytoplasm or they're controlling things like NF-kappa B activation or transcription factors. So that we feel comfortable about, but we don't know which parts of the stem and loop structure contribute to innate immunity, such as PKR or uh, cytokine regulation, including NF-kappa B. And that was actually my second question. Could this be actually be a protective response? Great question. Yes, I think there are people in, our, in this field um, that would argue that in, depending on the viral infection, these molecules could be protective. In some cases, they could cause extra release of cytokines, so therefore they would be inflammatory. And this is what we think is happening with HIV uh, patients. Um, depending on the circumstance, but you're absolutely right, it could control uh, immune system, whether it's a pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. So, so the patient that, um, the, the one that doesn't have the, the high levels. Yeah. If you were to look at the, um, you know, if you were to look, to look at the patient's chart, is that patient um, different from the other two? Um, not really. We've looked at it and we don't see much of a difference. Um, but what we've done is we've looked at other body parts. So we've looked at the uh, uh, cervical lavage. Uh, we are potentially going to be looking at the cells again. And it turns out that the number of infected cells may be lower in the last patient in the upper right-hand side. And so it may be that this patient overall has just lower number of infected cells. Therefore, our sensitivity of the assay is not that good. So if we were to do a, let's say, DDPCR, we might be able to detect this and, and higher levels. Uh, but that's a very good question. And, and we are pursuing this with Mary Young. 
Um, so we are thinking at this point that today, if you go to a clinic and they want to look for your whether you have HIV or not, they would isolate the RNA from your cells or from extra uh, from serum or, or blood, and they would do a series of standard uh, tests. Uh, and the, again, these are clinical tests approved by FDA, and they would tell you whether you have the virus or not, and that would be the viral copy numbers. We think that's a wrong way of doing things. We think that. Using nanoparticles, you can, in fact, separate exosomes away from viruses. And if you use one type of uh, nanoparticles, in this case, NT80, uh, you can enrich for the exosomes and do the PCR and find out that these are uh, HIV RNA positive, but they are not infectious material. Whereas if you use NT86, for instance, you can now trap the real virus and uh, at the bottom, you can do your PCR and define that, yes, indeed, that's a real virus and not an exosome. So we've written a grant with Ceres Nanosciences on this very technology. We have to go back, resubmit it. But we believe that the field is making a mistake in the sense that they are using uh, just HIV positive uh, uh, PCRs and calling those patients positive. We really don't think that's the case. They may be clinically cured but they certainly would carry exosomes that have the RNA virus in them. We're also doing some genetic work. So we're doing the uh, CRISPR-Cas model. Um, uh, this is with my colleagues at Scripps in California. And uh, here we are, uh, in fact, going in and trying to clip the tar out of the virus uh, and then uh, uh, isolating those viruses and, and the exosomes at the same time and figuring out if the phenotype that we expect, whether it's a pro or anti-inflammatory, whether the phenotype is present or not in recipient cells. So we're using the uh, nucleases. This is the gene therapy version of, um, of how to move certain parts of the virus. Um, and, and again, it's, we've been very happy with this. Uh, one piece of data I want to show you, and I'll, then I'll move on to the other viruses, is this particular slide. This is quite interesting. Uh, in lane one, so this is a T cell infected, monocyte infected, and myeloid infected. And these, um, uh, we are looking at um, a virus, presence of virus in here, and that's P24, so that means HIV is present. When you throw in antiretrovirals, the P24 is absent, and that's to be expected, right? That's what happens in clinic. Um, and again, same thing with the U1 and the OM10. On the other hand, if you try to capture the exosomes, what happens is you increase the level of exosome that is secreted from infected cells under therapy. So this, to us, is a big deal. We think that over time, if a patient is being treated for five or 10 years, it's true that the level of the virus may go down, but the level of these exosomes that contain RNA molecules or bets and pieces of the virus increase over time. And that precisely might explain why these patients have excess anti-inflammatory responses and cytokines. So we're excited about this. This was one of the reasons I feel that the NIH was very responsive to our grant. So model of the HIV, at least so far, is that we think the exosomes come in. They do contain these RNAs, whether they're double-stranded or single-stranded. I didn't tell you much about the single-stranded molecules. And they would bind to the TLRs, TLR3 in this case, or 7 and 8. They would turn on a series of cascades of proteins, including the NF-kappa B pathway, and they would turn on the cytokine. So we think this is a means of moving material from one place to another and potentially activating these other cells in other tissues and making them a, a, a available for the next round of viral replication. Now imagine these viruses are not going to go into cells that are sitting quiescent and replicate. They might enter, but they will not be able to replicate. On the other hand, if you have an exosome that's gone there first, turn on the signal transduction pathway, including the NF-kappa B, now you have a cell that's amenable for uh, virus replication. So this may be a true means of communication from one place to another, which is essentially no different than what you've seen with uh, stem cell development or with development uh, in general. 
The second virus, very quickly, I'm going to tell you is HTLV-1. I've been working on this for a long time also. This is uh, uh, with a colleague of mine at NIH, uh, Dr. Steve Jacobs in Building 10, um, and quite a few other colleagues uh, at EVMS and also Hopkins. Um, uh, HTLV-1 is a uh, close cousin of HIV, but it causes cancer. And in some cases, it causes HAM-TSP. This is where you have demyelination demyelination of neurons. And essentially, the patients are paralyzed from waist down uh, after about 20, 30 years or so. And so we've been doing a project with a very young, talented student. Um, um, and uh, we found some very exciting stuff. So this, this essentially tells you that the HTLV exosomes are easy to isolate. Again, this is published as a 2014 uh, JBC paper. Panel A just shows you a bunch of either normal cells or infected cells. In all cases, the exosomes show up at day four or five, so it takes a few days before they're uh, coming out. On the panel B, they show you, uh, it shows you that the proteins, normal proteins that you expect are there. And at the bottom, it shows you the size of these exosomes, which are smaller. You notice they are smaller. Again, this is one thing we've noticed. The sizes are smaller from when they're coming from infected cells. What we didn't expect is that these exosomes may have um, uh, proteins on the surface that may be involved in communication. That is. The question of, are these exosomes live? Are they alive? And one way of addressing that is to ask, if you have a content, if you have a lot of stuff inside these exosomes, can they be released? And what are some of the conditions that would allow them to release? And what we found is that you can certainly find proteins such as MDR. And these are important for transfer of drugs inside and outside of a cell. You can find these molecules uh, on the exosomes. And we did a simple experiment of utilizing calcium. This is where you would add calcium to the exosomes. And then use, through the use of nanoparticles, you pull down anything that didn't open up. And then you take the supernate and you do whatever you want with it, in this case, uh, Western blood. And lo and behold, we can find this so-called tax protein being released from these exosomes. These are proteins that are from infected cells from the virus. And it is a reason that cells could become cancerous. So it's essentially an oncoprotein. And quite uh, amazingly, they do release, uh, this is from infected cells, they do release the tox, they release cytokine. So you could almost imagine where these virus parts are enclosed. And then all you need is a little bit of a calcium for this thing to be released. We, can, we also believe that if you add a little bit of a charge, electrical charge, the composition of the membrane may change, and now you have stuff coming out. So they do have dynamic uh, molecules on them for breeding. And in fact, with Dr. Steve Jacobson, we're trying to ask this very same question using blood-brain barrier set of uh, 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 assays. So here we're trying to figure out if they are infected, CD4s or CD8s, will the exosomes be able to move through the blood-brain barrier? And the answer is yes, so far. Um, if the cells expanding, can they make even more exosomes? The answer is yes. And will these exosomes now help, help damage the neighbors? That is, help damage the neurons. And is that one of the reasons why these patients, after 20, 30 years of bombardment, of these exosomes, now they have demyelination and, and uh, uh, essentially cell, potentially cell killing of neurons. So we believe this may explain partly the pathology that we see there. Uh, very quickly, I'll tell you about RIFT. RIFT is a segmented virus. It's not a, the genome is segmented, means it's parts. It's not just one long linear molecule. And um, it's, it's quite an interesting virus. It's a uh, vector-borne, so you've got mosquitoes that can move this virus around. Uh, it is part of a, or at least it was part of a category A. I believe now it's gone to category B. Um, and we went ahead and tried to, so here's the problem. If you have a cell that's infected with rift, those cells will die. Now, what we did was we asked the question, what if you just leave this stuff in tissue culture? And what if there are resistant cells that can survive and live in presence of 10 to 8, 10 to 9, 10 to 10 molecules of virus? 
And that's precisely what we did. And that's how we came up with the so-called resistant clones. This work is just published. It's a collaboration with Dr. Hakami uh, 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 at NCBID. And essentially, we went through an infection of viral cells and looked for resistant clones over time, did dilution cloning, and identified purified clones and did a series of downstream assays. And one of the things we did was a TLR3 assay. That is, if the exosomes come out, will they have RNA molecules in them that will turn on a TLR3 in a uh, reporter cell? And the answer is yes, almost in all cases. You, you can see the varying levels. But what's interesting about it is that this particular virus does not attack immune cells. On the other hand, the exosomes from these uh, infected cells do attack immune cells and kill them. Now we're beginning to think that, wait a minute, this could be quite exciting. And by the way, these two cells, here's a T cell and a monocyte, so the blue and the red. So what we're thinking is that what if the virus has a certain tropism? It comes in, you can pick any virus you want. It can come in, immediately go into a cell and replicate and kill that cell. But once it's killing that cell during that process, if exosomes are made during that process or the cell manages to suppress the virus and now still you have more exosomes coming out, now these exosomes could potentially regulate other components or other cells, including immune cells. So this would be beneficial for the virus because if you kill the immune cells, now the virus can go into these other cell types and replicate without any trouble. So we think this may be true with many viruses, including uh, Rift Valley fever and including Ebola. We're finding similar results with Ebola. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Ebola. You heard about this. It's a uh, fairly simple virus. It is not a difficult virus to work with, other than it's a BSL-4, but you can have um, components of the virus to work with in a BSL-2 setting. You really don't need a BSL-4. If you look at the virus, it has glycoproteins outside. Uh, and of course, uh, it has a, uh, capsid proteins inside. That's the VP40. And what I'm going to tell you about today is mostly about VP40, because when we utilized three different proteins, the VP40 turned out to be the most exciting. The Ebola virus, unlike the Zika, is quite, uh, it's a rich field. It's, uh, people have sequenced this virus. It's been around for a long time. There's at least close to 90 different strains of it. So we're trying to figure out if the story I'm about to tell you has anything to do with only one strain or is it multiple strains. So we're paying close attention to this. But what you see in here is essentially different parts of the virus, the NP, VP35, glycoprotein. And a lot of people are paying attention to the glycoprotein because that's where the uh, uh, immune-mediated suppression comes in. So they're trying to raise antibodies against the GP portion. Um, Ebola is very close to two other cousins, Marburg and the uh, uh, Cuba virus. Um, um, but again, you see a lot more attention on the Ebola. Uh, minimal amount of literature or data on the Cuba, a little bit definitely more on the Marburg. But as you can see, they follow very similar uh, 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 genotypes, at least in terms of what they look like and the open reading frames. Um, and if you do their proteomics, there's a lot of cross uh, communication between these uh, three different viruses. So what we did was we uh, worked with a close colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Aman, uh, biotherapeutics, um, and uh, we talked to him about this and we used one of his VLPs, these are the viral-like particles, that he uses for immunization purposes. In fact, he had a PNAS paper about six months ago on this. And these VLPs contain both GP, VP40, and NP. These are three proteins from the Ebola. And what's nice about it is that if you look at the structure of these VLPs, it looks like Ebola, but it isn't because it doesn't have the genome inside. And as you can see, the uh, VLPs are not doing anything really much uh, to T cell, T cell, and a little bit maybe to the monocyte. So the VLPs are not toxic. On the other hand, if you isolate exosomes from uh, these transfected cells, whether it's a single, double, or triple plasmids, all of a sudden these exosomes are toxic uh, and they will kill uh, various cell types. In, in this case, we're using a monocyte 
and the VP40 is doing quite a bit of a killing, GP a little bit, and MP a little bit. But the most reproducible data we've found so far, this is unpublished, is the VP40. And here it's just the primary macrophages using primary cells. And I think you can see very clearly. And killing macrophages is not easy. These are cells that adhere. They don't die as easily. So VP40 of Ebola is clearly able to kill the uh, uh, macrophages. And we have collaborators overseas who are working with us on actual Ebola. And uh, this is an Ebola GFP strain. And this particular assay, they're doing uh, high throughput screening. We've given them a bunch of chemicals. Uh, and they're able to score not only for viral inhibition, but also exosome release inhibition. And we've been able to come up with uh, out of multiple drugs, uh, set of drugs actually, and second generation drugs, we're now able to find few of them, in this case, this compound number five, that is able to slow down the release of um, uh, uh, viruses and as, at the same time also slow down the uh, release of VP40 in the exosomes. Uh, and I, I'm not showing you that data because I don't have it with me. And so we're looking at second generation and third generation inhibitors, and we're looking at resistant uh, molecules uh, or resistant viruses in vitro. Trying to do the same thing as small animal models. Uh, the Ebola field is interesting in its own right. Whether you should do the experiments in monkeys or rodents, I actually favor the rodents initially before you go into the uh, to the large animals. So in conclusion, what I've tried to do is tell you that, of course, there's this field of virology, but then all of a sudden there's this emerging field uh, that's showing up in the infectious disease arena that, that includes these extracellular vesicles. These exosomes from infected cells do contain bits and pieces of the viral RNAs. Potentially, if you're a herpes virus person, you will see DNAs in there, probably. Uh, they, these RNAs are controlling the innate immune response of a recipient cell. Remember that diagram I showed you, the slide? There are three things we're interested in, the infected cell, the actual exosome, and the recipient. So the recipient, in this case, is getting regulated by these RNA molecules in the exosomes. Uh, when you have an infected cell and you have fixed so-called fix that infected cell and you stop the virus replication, in this case using antiretrovirals, uh, you may uh, have slowed down the virus, but in fact you have now potentially increased the amount of exosomes that come out that contain bits and pieces of that virus. So the real cure, maybe you have to go in and literally clip the virus out of the picture and not let the virus live in us forever and ever. So viruses that are latent uh, may be significant when it comes to this uh, exosome release. And then finally, exosomes from infected cells contribute to cell survival, cancer development. Uh, these are some, not all, but some of the uh, people who have contributed greatly, Sergei Ayrdansky, um, uh, uh, quite a bit of work there. Gavin, uh, we're very proud of his work. He submitted the F31 grant to NIH and received the one percentile. For those of you who don't know, one percentile is the, probably the best score you can get in the whole year for uh, in a study section. These are some, and this is Gavin here. He's graduating in a month or so, or finishing in a month. Uh, Monique Anderson from NIH, and these are some of my other colleagues listed on the right side. I'm grateful to Ramin Hakami for all of the uh, collaborative work uh, that he's done with me, Noor, uh, his student. And again, I have uh, part of the list of the people who've contributed, um, uh, but it's been a village to develop these different stories, and certainly not one or two people.